Hey, movie lovers, welcome to My Movie Story. I'm your host, Brian McAleer, uh, coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. I um, have a very special guest all the way from uh, Texas, America, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, if this is your first time to the show, thanks for joining in and, and checking us out. My Movie Story is all about chatting to everyday people about you know three very special movies, uh, their all-time favourite film, uh, the film that changed them or their perspective on life and the world, uh, and a film they think everyone must see at least once in their life. So those are the films we talk about. And uh, if you're new to the show, we've, we've already had some episodes drop online, so make sure you check those out. Uh, but today it's my pleasure to introduce um, a young man from uh, Texas, Jason Boyd, who I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing and working with for a few years now. And uh, Jason is a seasoned marketing professional uh, with a very diverse background in uh, uh, journalism, marketing, strategy, content production and digital media so he knows his stuff um however his enduring commitment really is to the exploration and elevation of the narrative arts uh, and this is really best demonstrated in his role as uh, an editor-in-chief for a site called fiction file which i've had the um, uh, privilege of writing for uh, definitely check out fiction file there's some great stuff on there as well uh, we'll pop the link in the in the show notes um, and over the past 11 years he's led a really passionate team in analyzing a wide range of fiction mediums, you know, illustrating his deep appreciation of storytelling. So movies, TV shows, books, so a really great website. So fiction is uh, is his middle name, <laughs> technically not, but, you know, we'll just say it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's got a very unique blend of marketing experience and his literary, literary insight uh, allows him to be a champion for both business and creative objects, objectives, sorry, with equal favor. So yes, this is a, a guy who knows fiction and we're going to have a great talk and really excited to find out what his three films are. Uh, Jason, welcome to My Movie Story. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing, Brian? Thanks for Fantastic. Having me. Yeah, really, really great to have you here and I'm so glad we could uh, work out our, uh, our time zones and, and get on the call and, and make this happen. So, um, and yeah, if... Um, Great, a great buy there, mate. Obviously, you know, you know fiction is uh, your bread and butter, and and movies and TVs and that, and TV shows and books and uh, yeah. Um, anything else uh, you'd like to tell us a bit about yourself? You know, where you're from and and anything like that. What's your story? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, you know born and raised in Dallas, Texas, um, and I currently reside in Texas. And uh, I've always wanted to be um, involved in. Uh, the narrative arts and I was always a writer and always a uh, imaginative kid and I would you know write movies and scripts growing up and and film with my brothers and and, and do stuff like that so I I've been doing that since a young age and I had the privilege of going to a master's uh, program at University of North Texas for uh, creative writing as well um, which I did for a while Cool. So I'll, just my whole life, uh, I've been in love with writing and fiction and just the narrative arts in general. Um, but um, yeah, right now I work as a marketer and yep. honestly that is uh, a saving grace because it in, ignites all of those creative things as well. Absolutely. And uh, I, I'd love to uh, explore that more. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think having that um that knowledge of marketing um i'm sure would help really help you understand how do you take this great story idea and, and get it out there in front of people you know because there's so many creative people out there who are creative writers and artists who um and uh, the downfall for a lot of us creative people is we don't know how to market our stuff and so it just kind of never gets read never gets seen never gets heard about so i think that's a really great um insight to be able to know how to do that and um and be able to help other people with that as well, which is which is really cool. Um, and I'm sure it would have been pretty challenging for you to choose just three films for us to talk about today, um, right. given you know your passion of the film and everything. Um, but we do have to settle on on three. Um, and I have a feeling you've chosen these three films. You've taken some real time and considerate thought to to pick them out, and uh, really keen to to hear what they are. So um, we might. We might kick it off with uh, your number one 
all-time favorite movie uh if we can uh so would you like to reveal what that is Yes, and this was very hard um, because favorite is such a, well, what does favorite mean? Um, it means so many different things, but I landed on the movie that I could watch a hundred times and probably already have, which is Groundhog Day. To the Groundhog. I always drink to world peace. Well, what should we drink to? I like to say a prayer and drink to world peace. Don't drive angry. Don't drive angry. He might be okay. Yes! Life has a funny way of repeating itself. What did you do today? Oh, same old, same old. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a favorite movie because... I have seen it so many times and I'm not as someone who sees movies more than once or twice. Right. Honestly, I'd rather watch a new one. Yep. I'd rather like go to a new one and I remember the story very well. But that that I've seen a, a thousand times. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And and the clever irony is that it's a film about a guy who repeats the same day probably a thousand times. And <laughs> right. you, and you think, where could that go? But it is so rewatchable. Um, brilliant. And and how did you first discover that film? Can you remember how it came into your life? Oh, yeah, it was just um, I mean, my, my brother was uh, born in the 70s, my oldest brother, and he was always introducing me to movies, you know, of Bill Murray's and everything like that. And so, you know, I was probably like eight when I saw the movie, mm -hmm. you know, um, like, and it was always on TBS and it's always on something that like I was watching. I was a homeschooled kid yep. as well. So like it would be on repeat and you could just yeah. watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so you could I probably jump in at any point and just know and know exactly where it was. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's perfect. It's uh, very modular in the aspect mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, you jump in at any point and you understand the concept and the concept's so boring that you just want to watch how it resolves. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. And I, we'll we'll come to this in a minute, but we, we see a lot of movies today that now uh, what we could use the Groundhog Day effect, um, you know, where it repeats the day and we, we can chat about them briefly. But um, yeah, what... what what are your thoughts on like as a standalone film, pretending there were no other Groundhog Day formula films, like in terms of an idea and a concept, you know, what is it about that idea of a guy repeating the same day over and over that is just so, you know, like fascinating and, and entertaining? Because it's, it's not just funny. It's funny. It is funny. And it's funny to be stuck in that situation. That's a funny situation. Mm -hmm. but it's also deeply philosophical yep it's, it's actually very um like bill murray and uh harold ramus um fought a little bit over bill murray wanting it to be more philosophical and uh ramus wanting it to be more comedic oh right okay so they're kind of pushing against each other like that and i think um it really opened up for bill murray to have you know, more serious roles and things like that. So it chose that line between a dramedy, mm -hmm. you know, like we know now as a, a dramedy. And um, I, I think there's just so much stuff to plumb there. I mean, you could go mm -hmm. deep into Nietzscheism yeah. and you know, the whole idea of doing something over and over again. And yeah. like, would you do the same thing if you could do it over again? Yeah. Uh, you, you watch it, you think like, what would I do? Would I... Would I steal the money like he does? Would I just try and pick up chicks every day? And because there's no hangover, or there's no having to call them the next day. <laughs> so there's, yeah, yeah, it makes you think. What would I do for sure? Yeah, which is the entertaining yeah. part of it. Yeah, and, and it really came along for Bill Murray at an interesting point in his career because obviously he's a Saturday Night Live alumni, and he did those kind of screwball comedies before. Ghostbusters like your Caddyshack and Stripes and stuff and then there was the Ghostbusters era which was the very deadpan Bill Murray uh, where no one takes him seriously he's just this overgrown kid but yeah then Groundhog Day came along and it was um it showed that dramatic side to him like you said and uh and could you imagine anyone else in the role of Phil Connors from Groundhog Day oh no 
Um, probably not. I think he's um, – Bill Murray plays the anchor. Yep. Of, like, the character of this anchor so well. Like, and he exudes so much confidence in his role that you believe – I mean, Bill Murray is obviously comfortable on camera. Yeah. But like he just plays this uh chauvinistic um kind of guy with a lot of flaws. And I think that's what Bill Murray does really well. Yeah. Is he plays people with lots of flaws. Yep. Uh that you you like regardless. And then, you know, in this film, obviously he learns and grows. Yep. Um, but I I think Bill Murray was just like a perfect uh, choice for that kind of character. A hundred percent. It was. It was really. You could just see it and be like, he's just playing himself. You know, he's probably like this in real life to to some degree. Um, yeah. And I, I just wanted to know if you've heard this. Uh, have you heard the theory that he repeats the day? I think it's fifty thousand times or something. Or have you heard anything different about, about the theory of how many times he actually yes. repeats Groundhog Day before he gets out? Yes, yeah, and so it's like, okay, so there's different ways to calculate it. So you can look at just the days like that you see on screen and then uh, add 10,000 hours so that he has like time to learn all of his skills and master them. Oh, you know, of course, yeah. So yeah. Using that as like kind of a variable uh, to plug in. Uh, for 10,000 hours, it, it gets to like 30 years. Wow. And so that's like one theory, you know. And then, of course, there's, um, I think Ramus himself said 10 years at one point. Right. And then another point said 10,000 years. <laughs> so we'll so, never know. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be, it could be, you know, I mean, it's funny to think 10,000 years. That's actually yeah. kind of a funny thought. But, yeah. Um, Mm. I'm sure it better like that regardless. So I think the idea of like the agony where he almost pushes past the agony of the day and has to come to terms with it. He has no choice. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I think it's that that final day where he spends the whole day doing good deeds for everyone. And uh, Rita, played by Andy McDowell, I think finally falls in love with him and then He's, he's, he's let go basically, but, <laughs> but yeah. And um, it's just such a clever concept and it's, it's it rem reminded me of a concept you might see in like a episode of the twilight zone or, or the X files. And you kind of think, okay, well, how can they, how can they stretch this beyond like just half an hour or so, but they find so many creative ways to show him. Like he goes through the cycle where he's just, you know, like offing himself in all these different ways and nothing works. <laughs> and then there's like him, like, trying to repeat these good deeds and like he keeps stuffing it up he, trying to you know romance reader and she just keeps slapping him in the face and all that so like yeah like I guess what do you think um what do you think was the the one action that got him to break out of Groundhog Day like do you have a, an idea on that like what was that final maybe good deed that helped him yeah I think I mean it's a lot of there's a lot of the if you look at the story structure, there's a lot of like him um, when he does the thing with the ice sculpture and like like just nails down her answers all the way, but it still isn't working. There's, I think, a side of him that clicks that like he has to be authentic about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the last like thing because he he's been doing all of these uh, things is like you know a task list that he needed to check off so that he could, you know, get into heaven or something, right? Like, and that's kind of a selfish moral ambition. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there is a, we never learn exactly what caused him to be in this loop. Uh, in an original version of the script, I think they had it uh, as like a witch cursed him. Oh, okay. Or something like that. But they took that out. So now it's just unexplained. Yeah. Um, Maybe it was the, the blizzard. The blizzard could have done it, maybe. But why was it only happening to him? You know. Uh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like, why was he the one chosen for it? And but you know, it it really it's like the only way to do it was apparently to just become a good person. So he just like had to at the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think he just realized it wasn't working otherwise. And he also, 
he I think he falls in love with her more legitimately the longer mm -hmm. the movie goes on. Yeah. You know? Earlier on, I think he's just trying to, you know, get her into bed, and she's not having a not having a bar of it. Uh, and then it's by you know doing all these other things for other people, uh, then she realizes that's that's what makes her fall in love with him. I think so. It's it's an interesting relationship, and they had really good chemistry. I think the whole cast was really well picked, and and all of that, and it was they're all right at the right point in their careers, and yeah, and um, just to sort of wrap up the Groundhog Day conversation, um, I'm interested to hear your take on all these other films that we've seen, you know, take that, the person who repeats the same day over and over. Yeah. Because in Groundhog Day, it's, it's not really uh, a time travel story. He's just stuck in this time loop. But then you have other films that have maybe used it as a as a time travel thing or or, or it's a curse. So, yes, out of the other kind of Groundhog Day-esque films, um, yeah. which of those have you seen and did you enjoy any of them and did you think they worked? Yeah, so I... Um... I, I I like it when they do the Groundhog Day thing. I like when like people try that because it's it's its own archetype. Um, it's like its own genre almost. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Russian Doll one I did not watch, but I heard that was really good. Okay, but one I watched and I liked because I've seen a lot of just kind of like poor ones, um, and they they usually have things to do with like you're stuck in a house or something like that and i'm like yeah. it's just it's just kind of lame it doesn't have the same moral like drive mm -hmm. but it was um tom cruise yep. and um i forgot uh forgot his co-star's name but um uh emily it, blunt yeah yeah emily blunt yeah and and the sci-fi movie yep edge uh, of tomorrow was, yeah edge of tomorrow which was yeah. originally um kill kill something like that it was like an anime that was that's based right on. yeah 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 but um that was actually really good it yep. just kind of like, it it could have done a little bit more with the heart of the story but yeah. like it was a really well executed yep. version of that so Absolutely. I, I mean it's hit or miss it's hit or miss but there's been a few yeah there is and i, I think i was thinking about um, which was the first film to take, and I think it might have been the movie Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal. Did you ever see that? No, I didn't see that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good. That's worth a watch. That's where he's uh, stuck on this train, and it keeps exploding, and he only has five minutes to find out where the bomb is, and and um, that's a basically a, a time travel one. But um, I think that was the first film to do it, and it was like, okay, well maybe maybe this this formula could work, and then a few years later, Edge of Tomorrow came out um the smother one what was that horror film one happy death day or something like that i think there was one about a girl who keeps getting murdered and coming back and has to find out who's killing her and all of that so yeah some interesting you know plays on the idea and um yeah like you said maybe it'll become its own genre or sub genre like groundhog day-esque films who knows or maybe they'll come up with a different name for it time loop who knows but <laughs> if it's done well it can be really entertaining but obviously groundhog day was was the original uh was the best um do you have like a favorite scene or favorite moment in the film that stands out for you? Um, I like, I like when it gets really dark. Mm. I like, I like the like scene of, <clears throat> I, I even like the one scene where you, it's the one scene that um, is not necessarily from his perspective because most of the movies kind of shot from his perspective. Yeah. Like you're seeing when he's in the scene, he knows what's happening, uh, but you don't see a scene where he's not present, mm -hmm. but there's a scene where he's in the morgue and he's laying on the slab. Yeah. And like looking at him and I'm just like, this is so like, he, so the day keeps going and he's just a corpse yeah. for a period of the day. Yep. I like that is so depressing. And yeah. it was just so, like, oh my gosh. So that and then at 6 a.m. the next day, it, it resets and yeah, he's back in bed. <laughs> but just the fact that they took it there, I I yeah. thought that was a really big chance. Uh yeah. and I think it took off because it makes the light stuff feel earned. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that was the point in the film where it showed it, it had it could go in another direction. It wasn't just a one note idea. And then that that period of the film where he just keeps killing himself, 
and it just becomes habit like every day oh how am I going to do it today and then I remember the scene where he's in the diner and he's telling her all the different ways he's killed himself and he's like I'm a god I'm basically a god you know <laughs> and yeah. then he's like well killing myself is not going to work what else could I try you know um such a brilliant film and, and a great choice and yeah um Groundhog Day um anyone who hasn't seen it it's early 90s Bill Murray so for some of our younger viewers you may not have known it uh, or seen it definitely check it out um it stands the test of time uh so yeah Groundhog Day all right so um now we're going to change uh, direction a little bit and um, I'm really curious to hear and I'm sure our viewers are as well um, the film you think everyone needs to see at least once in their lifetime um, and there's so many contenders out there and I'm sure you would have had more than one you could have chosen but um, you've had to settle on one um, I'm sure it was a really uh, careful choice um, so yeah if if you could tell us what that film would be, Jason, everyone needs to see at least once in their life. Yeah. Um, and what a, what a change of pace to go from groundhog to this, but, <laughs> but it is, uh, and I want to be serious about it is it's, uh, and to me, it seemed very much the thing that, um, everyone would choose i thought it would be taken i was just like yeah of course everyone's going to choose that first so to me it was a given so yeah. like uh, but the film is schindler's list I chose that just because um I'll be honest with you I've only seen it once mm -hmm. but it had such an impact on me that that's all I needed and I kind of my 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 you know family and friends and stuff that haven't seen it I would say I would watch it with them but I almost don't want to watch it again it's not it's not a pleasant viewing experience but mm -hmm. I think it's something that must be seen by everyone so that we don't forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Forget what happened. And yeah. And, and like you, I'd, um, I rewatched it recently for our, for our chat, but I'd only watched it once before all the way back in the late nineties in high school for, for an English uh, essay. And I didn't remember a lot about the plot, but I remember how it left me feeling and like, the power of film is like, yeah, you walk away with this feeling and impression, but for that feeling to remain for like nearly 25 years or however, however long ago it was, is that's unrivaled, I think, by any other film I know of. And um, can you recall the first time you saw it? Like what the circumstances were and how old you were? And... Yeah, I want to say I was like 14 maybe. It mm. was like early teens. Um, and I just... Um... I think I saw it on, you know, Showtime or something like that. Um, and I was alone. And because I was very, uh, like I said before, I was homeschooled and very unsupervised. It was kind of a unique household. But um, I had time to like just watch things alone that maybe were too old for me or right. I should have had a content warning. But I remember just w watching it and, you know, the Nazis are such an important lesson for all humanity. And you learn about it in, you know, school, like you learn about it factually, you learn the numbers of like how many people maybe were killed and, and, you know, the, the numbers vary by your estimates mm -hmm. and it's all very cold and calculating, but when you see, some of the things in that movie, which Spielberg just kind of does it almost like a documentary style. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you're just, you're just looking at it and you can't look away. Yeah. And hmm. I, I just think, you know, if, if I'd gone to public school, I would expect to be shown that at some point, like in my senior year, just to make sure that when I leave, I know 
the worst thing that humanity can do and like what they're capable of mm-hmm. and as a guard against letting that happen again. Mm-hmm. 100%, yeah. And I, th- I think you touched on a really interesting point about how it was made. Um, and prior to this, Spielberg had done your adventure films, your family films, your E.T., Indiana Jones, um, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, this was the film that showed the world he was a, a really serious acclaimed director not just the helmer of all these blockbusters and and it brought in his first oscar for best director and and it doesn't necessarily follow a traditional um movie arc you know it doesn't really side with either um the jews who are being persecuted or the nazis it is more of a just a here's what happened um and what what, yeah can you elaborate a bit on the, the style of the film and and how do you think that does that serve it or does it is it maybe too hard to watch at times? Like, yeah, what are your thoughts on, I guess, Spielberg's sort of directorial choice of, of where he went with it, you know? I think, um, and I and I think uh, the cinematographer whose name escapes me um, said that he intentionally um, wanted to give it a timeless look. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's important too, because it could happen at any time and it's it happened in the 40s but you know it could happen in any time and black and white matches the documentary style of the time and it makes it just kind of a classic where you're you're expecting it to be in that style it fits the time period it mm. fits everything and it's um i mean it's almost like it was filmed back in the day yeah like, it's remarkable it happening. yeah and you just feel you just feel so immersed. I mean, I remember the movie is at times you know slow and and things like that, and probably not something a fourteen year old would normally <laughs> like, want to watch. No, but it does hold your attention because you know, like you see these you know horrible things. And I think I don't know. Rick Fines also, I think really portrays um Mm. who people have been like uh, psychologists have diagnosed him as a psychopath like that character as a psychopath and just seeing like his every time he was on screen and i i just knew this man was capable of something horrible and he was the he was the the you know the the feet on the ground of the nazi movement for the movie to me and so Mm. uh, it was a very chilling performance from him um and he's a character that you just watched and despised and it was like oh how how could a person do this and i remember one of the scenes of, of him that stood out for me the most was the like in the morning he just walks out onto the balcony gets his rifle and just starts randomly shooting you know the prisoners uh, like it's you know a morning ritual for him and that was I thought was so disturbing um, and like to imagine being someone living in that situation where you, you you could just be shot at any time for for no reason whatsoever and the film definitely portrays that in a number of scenes that are very hard to watch and um, but like you said and why you've chosen this film um, necessary for people to understand and not forget what actually happened you know, because if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, you know, I find. Um, and I think we tend to repeat history anyway, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. But um, just just coming back to, I guess, the, the story itself and, and how, what was your, like, I guess, connection with the character of Oscar Schindler, um, played by Liam Neeson? Um, did you find him sympathetic? Did you find him just opportunistic? What were your thoughts on him? I mean... Obviously, he starts out as just, you know, a rich guy looking to make a buck. Like, he's with the Nazi party. Like, he's, you know, dealing, he's wheeling and wheeling and dealing with these Nazis. Um, and he's just looking at, he's looking at the Jews as, you know, the way we look at migrant labor sometimes in the U.S., you know, where it's just like, this is cheap undocumented labor essentially you know yeah. like hey we can pay them nothing mm-hmm. and it's a ghetto um as a result 
and um i think he has a great arc in it and um you know even the book that the movie was based on was called um uh schindler's arc mm. is that what it was called so yeah. I mean, you know his, his arc is a big part of the story yep. and obviously you have that final you know scene that is you know on youtube you guys should look it up just the the scene where he's talking about how much more he could have done oh yeah i was a mess after that watching that bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i've never seen someone own up to what they've done so much like that yeah. like that yeah. was such like he 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 regained his humanity he did and, but like, he couldn't go back in time and do things differently mm. and yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of he was a very complex character wasn't he and um yeah it's interesting how we see him at the start he's like this you know suave sophisticated kind of a uh, playboy of sorts and um obviously got a lot of money in his pockets and he he butters up the nazis so they'll you know help him and he helps them so he's very business minded you know tries to make it a win win and i really liked the scenes between him and the um i forget the name of the character R- ralph fines played the commandant Go- goeth i think or something like that yeah, um, goeth or how you pronounce it yeah. yeah something along those lines and how he tried to get through to him um and tell him to basically stop killing people and as i was as i was sort of looking at that scene i'm like is he just doing this because he wants him to stop murdering innocent people for no reason or is he like stop killing my workforce you know and mm-hmm. i thought maybe he started off as a like you know where's my workforce where are my people and then one by one, he started to get to know them as individuals. And like he said, he, yeah, he really reclaimed his humanity, which is one of the the big themes of the film. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, What was there a particular scene or moment of the film that you remember the most and uh, that you might you would often t- think about or talk about with people? I think it's that final scene, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Like, I can't... Uh downplay that and think of another one <laughs> to just to, yeah. just to be uh, unique like it really it is that final scene because that um i mean it's just heartbreaking because everyone's surrounding him mm-hmm. they they're so thankful for him they you know see him as a savior and just the like he's gonna have to live with that for the rest of his life you know and like he's yep. gonna really have to, and so is everyone else mm. that didn't stop things mm-hmm. or did you know yep. raise their hand sooner. Yeah, uh, and I think it really touched on the the notion of survivor's guilt. You know, yeah. like he he came out of that still, you know, and he, I think he went on for another 30, 40 years before he passed. But like, yeah, I could have done more. What else could I have done? Absolutely, like, yeah. It's um really plays with the emotions. And um would you say this is Spielberg's greatest film? I think it's his most important. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So greatest, you know, is subjective. You can, you know, say one of his more uh like dynamic movies or like yeah. I, I know he, he reeled back. Um he even he said that he he didn't want to rely on crutches of filming. Like he didn't want to do, you know, dolly shots. He didn't want to do like cool camera movements and stuff. He wanted to keep it very simple and force like this because he didn't want to use tricks that he had. He wanted to just document what it yep. was. Yep. And but yet he does do it aesthetically pleasing. You know, and and it's like he's he is a master with confined tools, mm-hmm. and he deliberately confined himself with that. And I think some of the best art comes from constraints. Mm. I think yeah. you place yourself on even an arbitrary constraint, and it just makes you think outside the box to try to work with that constraint. Yep. And you know, yeah. it, it gives you it gives you startling scenes that are beautiful but yet disturbing. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I, and I just remember that same year Jurassic Park was released. So you had Jurassic Park and Schindler's List in one year, and it just shows he really was at the height of his creative powers back then. And what two very different films from one director filmed over the space of you know eighteen months? It's it's remarkable, and 
and I think that really projected him to become one of the greatest directors of all time and still working today, obviously slowing down a little bit, but, um, you know, still punching them out. And, uh, yeah, a lot of other great films he's done as well. So, uh, and um, just final question on Schindler's List before we move in, move on. So someone going to watch it for the first time, would you would you say anything to them? Would you say here's what to expect, here's what it's like versus not what it's not like, or would you just be like, watch it? <laughs> what would be your um, I would just say um, I would say there's scenes where you're going to want to cover your eyes but try not to mm -hmm. because you're paying respect to the people who that actually happened to and they those things need to be seen and carried with us yeah so we can learn from it. so yeah. don't be aware that there's stuff that you're going to want to look away from and i wouldn't show it to anyone I, personally who is under 18 because i think it's just like you see things that are just horrible and it's just that kind of movie where you need to be of a certain age but if you are of that certain age, you should watch it with open eyes. Definitely. Yeah. Great, great advice. It's uh, yeah. Like most of us uh, definitely have something to watch. You might watch it once and never again, but you'll, you'll never forget it. Um, so yeah. Schindler's list. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Uh, so for our final film, um, I have a feeling we're going to change pace completely uh, once again um, to finish on a bit of a lighter note. Uh, so this is the film that, um, the the films that people pick from this category are so diverse because it is such a personal choice uh, because it is the film that you feel you've connected with uh, the most that had a profound impact on you as an individual, as a moviegoer, as a creative person. And it opens your eyes to, you know, what movies could be, what life could be. Um, so that's like the film that we all tend to sort of have a bit of ownership over and claim and be like, this is, this is my film, you know, um, hence why we call this my movie story, you know? So <laughs> uh, what is that movie for you, Jason? That movie is, and I won't even introduce this. <laughs> I'll introduce it by saying it needs no introduction. Uh, Star Wars, A New Hope. Yep. That's it. <laughs> Star Wars, a billion years in the making. The Force will be with you, always. And the conversation's over. <laughs> no. Exactly. What, what can we say? Right, absolutely. Um, uh, and just just so people are clear, this is the original Star Wars that came out in 1977 or whenever it was uh, that that started it all. Yeah, originally just originally just called Star Wars. So the Star Wars, yeah, Star Wars. yeah. And yeah, then and when the, the credits come up the screen, Episode Four, and people were like, "Hang on, this is an wait a minute, film. what's going on here?" Right, it was, um, it was one through three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they came 22 years later or whatever it was. But um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, everyone knows Star Wars, like. Can you remember seeing the first film for the first time? Can you describe yeah. that? Yeah, and it's funny because it's part of the reason I got picked this is, you know, it was one of those movies I saw as a young person that my oldest brother was a huge fan. He had all the toys and everything. And um, it was kind of like it was shown to me at an early age of like, you need to know like what this is because um, it's cool. And, um, you know, it's inspiring and it, it uh, ignites your imagination and, you know, it's everything a kid would want. But what I really, and this is why I picked this, and it's a little different, uh, I'm putting a little twist on it, is that, cool. Cool. of course, you could pick Star Wars for so many reasons. And it, I mean, I have like 20 Star Wars shirts, <laughs> you know, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I've seen all of the stuff. Um, and we need to catch up on some of the TV show stuff. But mm -hmm. um, yep. But I've been a Star Wars fan for life. I used to role play Star Wars when I was uh, 13. I would go on StarWarsFans.net. Yep. Shout out to StarWarsFans.net. 
and uh, go to their discussion board and like role play as a Jedi Knight. Yeah. So I I've, I've just been so influenced by it. But the twist I'm putting on it is that I uh really it changed my like perspective and changed like who I was because of the behind the scenes stuff. Right. Like just seeing the you know it was on the discovery channel all the time or pbs would have something about it where it was just talking about oh and then they just took this clay and made these little animals and and then filmed that on a black screen and then overlaid that onto the chessboard and that's how they did the little holographic thing and oh, I was just right, like, right. Yeah. I was like, so there's actually like rules and stuff to this magic i've seen on screen yeah yeah you know? And that just blew my, that was the, the light bulb that went off mm. was I can create this. There's secrets to be had. I just have to learn the trade. I just have to learn the tools. Yep. And I've been trying to learn tools like in that regard mm -hmm. uh, my whole life. And yeah. uh, I remember asking my dad for, you know, computers and stuff because I wanted to learn special effects. I wanted to learn how to, actually create all that stuff in the computer and everything as well uh so it influenced it influenced the way i watched movies because mm -hmm. movies are so uniquely tied with technology it's art and technology like you can't take the technology out of movies no no and and so it just cemented that back for me and it, my love for technology is is just as great as my love for star wars so yeah um well, well, that film was so pioneering in, in every way, like the idea, the concept, the scope of the film. Uh, like you said, the technology that was either innovated or created to make it happen was like no one had ever seen anything like that before. Um, and, and you mentioned earlier at the start how you, when you were young, you were wanting to write scripts and stories and develop your own ideas. Was there any Star Wars influenced uh, ideas there of yours? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. of course, um... <laughs> You could always say there's a, I mean, a bit of Star Wars and everything nowadays, honestly, mm -hmm. like, because Definitely. it's, it's all, it's Joseph Campbell and it's the hero's journey and all that stuff. And so it's kind of the roots of storytelling and it follows, it follows such a, just such an empty kind of archetype that you can paint so many colors inside of it mm. and you know star wars made a few choices but like you could take the basic blueprint of star wars and write any story yeah but just change the details Absolutely. and yeah. so like i'm sure i'm sure i mean just the the idea of you know a, a young boy who <laughs> who takes off to save things you know i've, I've definitely written those stories 100 so, percent. yeah yeah. that's the thing and and you know it, like you said it touches on the hero's journey um luke skywalker as, as the everyman character that we can all relate to and all you know we all see the film sort of through his through his eyes and then you can go back to it and watch it from obi-wan kenobi's perspective you can go back and watch it from han solo's perspective so there's so many layers and levels to it and i think it either created this formula or it tapped into something that was was already there and just portrayed it in a way that was so clear and original. <clears throat> That's probably what makes it so influential um, in a lot of ways and, and how it's still being revisited and revamped and explored today. And and um, I guess the other iterations of Star Wars, so you had the prequels and then the, um, the sequels from the past decade, the TV shows. Uh, have you, yeah, thoughts on those? Like, have you been along the, for the whole Star Wars journey or is there parts of it that haven't quite... In, quite grabbed you yeah I, I never watched any of the cartoons so clone wars and stuff i never oh watched. yeah um i was kind of interested in them i just couldn't like find the time to like invest in it and it just went by yeah but um i watched uh you know mandalorian yeah i'm almost caught up on mandalorian i should say um and i mean i love where that stuff's going mm -hmm. um i wasn't a big fan of the sequel trilogy but uh i i like um uh i like what's uh what's favreau john favreau 
the director of yep. Amanda Warren and showrunner and everything. Yep. He, I think he should have more control, honestly. I think okay. his yeah. version of Star Wars because I feel like it's about. I mean, if we like, like you said, we could have a whole podcast on Star Wars. Hundred yeah, percent. But <laughs> but Han Solo is such, um, the the heart of Star Wars to me. Because it's someone who doesn't use the force, who still chooses to do good, you know, to help mm. things. And yeah. It's like, so he he's almost the everyman, you know, yeah. like Luke is the everyman, but he's special too. And it's like, maybe yeah. I'm special, but I could be Han Solo, I guess. Mm. Um, but yeah. I don't want to be Han Solo because he's so cool. Uh, so, you know, as a kid, you have that as well. Absolutely. But um, I think... Uh, Favreau is tapping into that you know people making human choices stuck in the middle uh you know and having to kind of live between this war of the empire and and everything like that so mm. uh, I think he's he's dealing with stuff that to me was always interesting from a world building standpoint because I think scum and villainy in general is a huge part of Star Wars yeah 100% I think it grounds it. Yeah, um, it does. It's like it's yeah. kind of fimil- similar, similar, uh, familiar story elements and characters we've we've seen in life and and other things, but just you know, plopped in the center of space, essentially. <laughs> this whole canvas of like all these planets and worlds, and it's like it's endless. Which is, I guess, why we you know filmmakers keep going back to the Star Wars well, and um. I wonder if George Lucas even conceived that that was possible when he was writing and making the first Star Wars, the the legacy that it would have. And yeah, um, any thoughts on the prequels? You know, the prequels. <laughs> Tough call. Um, I uh, so I showed my girlfriend uh, all Star Wars. She had never seen it, and she liked the prequels the most. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and I watched it, you know, up for the 12th time or something or whatnot. And they're good for kids. And I think that is George Lucas. I think he, when he wrote episode four, he knew that it could be a thing because yeah. George Lucas is like a businessman. Oh, big time. Yeah. He's a visionary. And so he knew that there was like this potential. Um, but then, you know, once he started doing the prequels, he's laying it out where he's like, well, you know, you start watching the movies when you're a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the way. To so let's make kid friendly versions. Yep. And then as they get older, they can watch the other versions. And that's then right. it's a life, lying, lifelong association. And um, Disney buying Star Wars is like the best uh, thing that ever happened, in my opinion, because uh, Star Star Wars is about nostalgia in that way it's about like growing up with a story and then being able to look back on it like that because mm. it's of all ages and can appeal to you throughout ages yep uh, but then uh you look back and um yeah you just find that i'm sorry i lost the train of thought <laughs> <laughs> yeah how how like there's a, a version of Star Wars for every generation almost, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And Disney, I'm sorry, my, my train of thought comes back to me now. But Disney, um I listened to a podcast with um uh the someone in charge of innovation at Disney for a while. And yep. he did this big study and with all the Disney fans and basically it the conclusion was that nostalgia was the one thing that Disney could bank on. Yeah. Because Absolutely. everyone grew up with it. Yeah. And all you just, you just need to appeal to, you can have your children, just like my oldest brother showed me the movies. You can show your kids the movies and then they'll yeah. be like you. And then yeah, when they grow right. up, they'll do it to their kids. Yeah. And it it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's perfect. It's, it I is. Yeah. Yeah, look, look at it as capitalism uh, in a bad way, but I, I think it's a way to preserve a timeless story. Absolutely. And look, if it's done well, then, you know, bring it on, you know, like I, I haven't had the chance to watch The Mandalorian yet, but everyone, I've heard nothing but good things about it. 
Um, you know, I liked Rogue One, the spin-off story. I thought that was really good. Um, Solo, eh, yeah, on the fence. But um, yeah, just just to, I guess, wrap up the Star Wars conversation because we we could fall down the rabbit hole and be here for hours. But um, future of Star Wars, what what would you like to see or where do you think they could go with it? So I was just thinking about this is that um, I think they should keep doing their TV shows and their spinoff stuff and building the world out because that will inform what the larger story is. Yeah. Because you have a multi-platform, if you will, story where you have you know lots of different mediums and ways to tell it. Yeah. And that, that will help to keep doing that so that you have just tie-ins to kind yeah. of do, just like doing Marvel. Uh, but my big thing is I would love to see them, and this might be controversial to some of your viewers, but <laughs> I, I would love to see them remake the original trilogy. Ooh. Okay. With all new actors. Yep. And what you do is you just start, you make a new hope all over again. And it's with new actors. It's a reboot. And then in five years after that, you come out with episode five, five years after that, episode six, and then you remake the prequels. Yeah. And then you eventually get to remaking the sequels and you make them better this time yep. with all the expanded universe knowledge that you've gotten. Yeah. That people like from the TV shows. Interesting. And you yeah. the end of your sequel trilogy. And then you also have like a 30 year plan to roll out your movie. I mean, from, yeah. A, yeah. from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. It's, great. it's a great absolutely. opportunity absolutely yeah. yeah look that's that's interesting that's an interesting idea and uh i guess even star wars like you know the the universe and its story would have some kind of limit where it's like oh hang on now they're going really deep with this i mean are they going to have a show about the guy that ran the bar in a new hope you know what i mean like could they could they go that far with it it's like come on you're really milking this now but yeah sometimes it is about going back resetting and looking at it from a different from a different angle um could be really interesting so um all right and um just final star wars question um aside from the original film like any of the other star wars content shows movies would you have like a second place uh for your favorite one so you know it would be hard um to choose a favorite movie it was hard for me to choose a favorite movie i should say because you know empire strikes back the second star wars or the fifth if you will um is is my favorite mm. one of my favorite movies of all time like it's yeah. it's hard to not choose that Definitely. um just because i think it's got it's got everything and it's even got a cliffhanger which for its time was kind of like a cliffhanger in movies you know yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but you see it now all the time um and uh yeah, that's that's hmm. such. Again, the scum and villainy comes out absolutely in that one. Too. Yeah, so that's that's kind of my sweet spot. Definitely, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Empire is uh, one of the more darker, more mature films in the in the series. Um, and yeah, like whatever stage you're at in life, you can you can discover or rediscover some element of Star Wars, and uh, you know, and start all over again and fall in love with it all over again. I think it'll always be around. It's a it's a staple of cinema. I'm sure you would probably agree that it's uh, certain franchises come and go and won't be revisited, but Star Wars, I think, will will always be there in some form or another, um, which is pretty pretty amazing. It's got some. It has obviously has its uh, has its place in cinema. Um, we couldn't imagine the movies without it. I think, and and how it's impacted cinema is, is pretty huge. Um, but yes, I think. Um, yeah, all good things must come to an end, and uh, like we we could definitely do round two of this and and talk about just the first Star Wars film, and I think there's entire podcasts dedicated to Star Wars, so we might be uh, we might have a bit of competition there, but uh, yeah, look, we we uh, we could always do that and revisit the conversation in a special episode. So, uh, but for now though, we've we've heard all about uh, your three films, Jason, three really diverse films in every regard. Uh, you've got your deadpan bill murray style comedy of groundhog day you've got your important historical um film in schindler's list and then you've got star wars you know we don't need to say anything else about star wars everyone knows it everyone's heard of it uh so really great uh films uh it's been a, a fantastic chat and uh, i guess i like to sort of finish with this question it's a it's a bit of a big one but uh 
the future of movies, the future of cinema. Like, what do you, where do you think it's going? What would you like to see? What are you excited about? Um, or even just any films coming out you'd like to watch that you'd want to recommend? I think the future of cinema is such a great question, but it's, I would go like 10, 20 years in the future, maybe to start. And I think we're going to see a lot more home theater things. Yeah, uh, just enhance it because everyone's watching movies at home and streaming at home. Mm-hmm. So that at the home environment, the speakers and everything. I have Sono speakers. It's yeah, you know, it's great. Like seven point one surround sound. It, wow, it, it's amazing. And you go to a movie theater and it's it's got a big screen, but sometimes everything's not perfect. So I think the home theater thing will expand, and then I think you'll still have theaters that run the 70 millimeter uh, Oppenheimer print you yeah know, the the giant perfect you know technology use of showing it in its best light mm. I think that would be a thing but I think we'll mainly see the home theater grow yeah definitely yeah I, I agree with you there I think that's that's the future of it and Hopefully there's still a place for cinemas. Um, I'd hate to see them disappear altogether like video stores have. You know, and I've, we've chatted with previous guests about, you know, how video stores are sorely missed and it would be great to bring them back in some form. Uh, hopefully we still have a place for cinema. But, yeah, like uh, it is convenient watching films at home and having a great setup. And, you know, if it helps people see more movies and explore movies they normally wouldn't watch, then that's that's a positive thing, I think, because um, you can go to any streaming platform now and just be like, oh, what's this, what's this? You know, and there it is. It's like, all right, I'll give that a shot. Yeah. So whereas when you go to the cinema, obviously for one film, and the video store is more like you just browse up and down the aisles. So we've got all these different ways of how we have watched movies, how we're watching movies now. So I think, um, yeah, that's 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 a good thing uh, as long as they don't shut down the cinema. <laughs> but um, absolutely. Well, thank you, Jason, for yeah your thoughts on that and uh, for bringing us uh, your thoughts on those three films. Um, I'm sure most of our listeners uh if they haven't seen all of them have, have definitely heard of them and the whole idea of the show is you've you've heard someone else's take on it and maybe you'll watch it with through a different uh lens this time and and see something new and, and rediscover the movie for yourself um so thanks jason it's been a real uh treat chatting with you uh a, you know former movie lover it's always it's always a great conversation and uh thank you for being uh, a part of my movie story yeah thank you so much for having me